Hello, doing the. Make sure we're not getting weird frame blending. All right, it is Wednesday. My usual time for some live casting, chatting with you guys, seeing how things are going. I am uh, in a funky place right now because uh, my mom, I had to go to. Hi, Luca. I had to go to. Uh, my mom had a weird episode, so I took her to the hospital uh, a couple days ago. And it's like whenever you take anybody to the ER, it's like I'm gonna. If you take them, if you take them around 11:30, it's like I'm. I know I'm gonna be here till 4 a.m. So that was my day the last couple of days. I think she's doing better. They're running a whole bunch of tests on her as per usual. I have a feeling it's probably an uh, 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 e- uh, infection of some sort, but we're just trying all the other stuff. You can't see me. Oh, that's a good point. I should probably cut to myself. I'm looking at the view. F- I'm looking at the preview, my image on the preview monitor, and I forgot the program monitor's on the right hand. Thank you for mentioning that. Hey, welcome everybody. I'm sure you guys can see, hear, and see me now. Let me know if the uh, if the uh, volume is too loud and all that all that nonsense. Um, so yeah, I'm, I've been kind of way off uh, my head, so I've been spend f- just playing with my hands. That sounds terrible. I've been uh, doing stuff with my hands recently, and I got a th- uh, last time we t- talked. I think we guys talked about how I got a 3D printer. So I'm, I'm messing around with that. And the 3D printing is, it, it teaches you a lot about the relationship and technology. Because I was just having a discussion before I got online here with somebody on, on Facebook about how, I guess an argument, uh, I, there's a lot of videos out there about people 3D printing homes. And you see like the concrete pour going around and 3D printing the home. And uh, it's being hailed as kind of a revolutionary breakthrough. And I think it's, it's cool, it's awesome. However, now that I've started the hobby of 3D printing, I've realized that uh, 3D printing is not uh, not the thing that you think it is. It's not as simple as hitting the button and saying print and it prints up and you're like, oh, that's cool. It's it's uh, done. Um, no, it's it's much more complicated than that. It's it, there's, there's a lot of different variables involved, a lot of different. Uh, uh, why, uh, I'm just, just seeing here a lot of different. Oh. People are hiding screens. A lot of variables, a lot of crazy, a lot of a uh, lot of technicalities, a lot of getting things right. A lot, of th- a lot of things can go wrong in 3D printing. I mean, it, it is essentially a craft of its own, and there's so much to do and so much to learn. And there's so, like, I'm just printing some some figurines just for fun of it, and like, man, there's just just the finishing. The, there's so much. Anyhow, my point is, don't think of 3D printing as a solution to everything. Um, one of the model, the model I'm, I'm doing right now is the Red Riding Hood thing. It has a base, it's an oval base, and I, and I put it on my slicing program slicer, which is how you program it for the 3D printer, and it's uh, it's saying to me that it's going to take about 12 hours to print this rect- this oval base, which has no features on it whatsoever. And I thought to myself, why am I going to spend 12 hours printing this thing when uh? When I can just buy a piece of wood and it does accomplishes the exact same thing, and I would uh, literally have spend a lot less time printing it, a lot less time you know sanding it down, polishing it, and finishing it. So uh, yeah, um, let's see a comment here. I'll throw it on the my monitor here. ACs with 3D printing know-how are like magicians. That's one of the things I've been 3D. I've been 3D printing a couple things. Like I 3D printed a uh, a stand for my A10 Mini. So when I shoot out, when I go to a live stream, I can have a little stand that this holds it up. I've printed little clips. I've printed, uh, and I think I'm going to use the 3D printer to print kind of just anything that I want for the lessons. If I want to do like a video, a, a video about lenses, I can do a lens support, a lens housing, and all that stuff. So there's a lot of stuff I can. Be cool to the three D print. I'm just kind of getting used to the setup here. Hold on, let me. So that let's, so that kind of leads me into the topic that I wanted to talk about. Something that I've been thinking about lately, and that is this this term. It's toasted. So if you saw the thumbnail, I have I drew a little picture of the product life cycle. How when you're the very beginning of the product life cycle and, t- and technology, you have tremendous growth in the quality. Like iter- the iterations of the quality just jump up. You have 1.0, 2.0, 3.0. It's like, man, you got to get the latest one because there's so much, it moves so fast. But as the product matures, the quality 
the incremental quality were diminishes. So like, you know, it, it, when they first came out, um, well, I'll give you, let's go pick a weird example. When they first came out, like blenders let's, or microwaves, microwaves are good. When they first came out, microwaves were really crappy, but the next generation got better and it got better. It's so good, right? But now, do you care about the 2021 model of the latest microwave? Is that going to be any different than the 2019 model of the microwave? No, it's, there's absolutely no, I mean, there might be small differences. They might introduce a self-cleaning thing, but it only works some of the time. And yeah, I don't know if it's that great, you know. So the incremental improvements are, are getting less. Where we are with filmmaking, where we are with techn camera technology is at that point where we are in the entering into the maturity phase, entering into the, the diminishing returns, diminishing iterations of technology are not going to get as revolutionary as they once were. And believe me, they were amazing. In the last, let's put, let's put a marker on 10 years, the last 10 years have been astounding as far as the technology goes, as how much has improved. We've gone from... Oh, Pick 20 years. We've gone from basically standard definition being everybody, everybody was shooting standard definition to high definition to now 4K to now 8K, which is an incremental improvement from, from 4K. So there, so we are reaching that point where it's not getting as, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, but the latest, the, the, I've seen threads of the latest Black Magic. What's the, what's the, what are they going to release about the latest Black Magic? What's the news? I don't know. I'm not sure it's going to be as, as cool as what happened when Blackmagic introduced their very first cinema camera, which I still have somewhere around here. I mean, it's it's actually not it has not served it is not uh, it is not held its quality anyhow. But anyhow, um, but we're at the point where we're very we're at incremental improvement, right? And now we're in the marketing hype stage, and that's where the term where I get the get. get it's toasted and it comes from the very first episode of Mad Men which is a fantastic show right Mad Men series on AMC starring John Hamm so forth and playing a Madison Avenue uh, you know exec executive the very first episode uh, Lucky Strike Cigarettes it's 1960 they came into his advertising agency and say well the government is basically saying we cannot advertise the health benefits of cigarettes anymore so that, that would be a complete and total lie right so what do we do and Don Draper's like well okay well I don't know um Tell me how you make your cigarettes. And the, and the cigarette, the, the tobacco uh, execs as well. First, you know, we, we get our tobacco from, from Louisiana. It's grown, in, and then we bring it to our factory where it's toasted, and then we, then we manufacture. And Don Draper's like, stop. Uh, he, he said, that's, that's it. It's toasted. And the, guy, the, the tobacco industry is like, yeah, so what? Every, everyone else toasts their tobacco. And then the, the owner of the tobacco company is like, yeah. It's toasted. So that became, I mean, I may be describing the scene not quite ex verbatim, but that encompasses the feeling I have about technology today. Like, we're at the point where everybody toasts their tobacco. Everybody toasts the tobacco that goes in a cigarette, but ours, it's toasted. Ah, that makes you sound like you, your tobacco is better than the other. Maybe your tobacco is more wholesome. Your tobacco reminds me of breakfast and, and uh, you know, breakfast around the, 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 uh, the, the nook and the morning cup of joe. It's toasted. Oh, that's where we are with technology. Like the other day, uh, somebody was on here was saying, like, I only prefer cameras with global shutter. Global shutter. Hey, Joe. How are you doing? Wrong cast is up here. Yeah, I'm gonna. I'll, I'll head, after this this cast, I'll come up and hang and hang out with you because I, I got that file for you. <laughs> but yeah, so it's it's uh, become like the toasted thing has is basically. I'll go back to it. Yeah, I, I got sidetracked because Joe came online. Dang it, Joe. Um, but yeah, I prefer global shutter. Global shutter, you know that became. Like you don't know what global shutter, <laughs> like you. There are like a couple instances where you actually might want global shutter, you know, or there's very specific needs for global shutter. But most time, who cares? The other thing, like the one thing that that I, I whenever a new camera comes out, you always see this on the comment section. If it doesn't shoot 120 frames a second or 240 frames a second, then I cannot use it. And I th I think to myself, like maybe obviously different use cases, right? But I have, in my life, I've used the, uh, I have used high, shut, high frame rate for slow motion capture. I've used it 
twice professionally. I mean, I, I use it just to test it out, but I like, I've never been called to like, okay, you need to shoot some slow motion footage. Oh, good. I've got this camera. Like my use cases, I, I don't ever need more than 60. If ever that, I mean, there's very few cases where I actually will shoot 60. Um, but I don't do that much slow-mo. Again, my use case, I don't really have a, a, a place for it. <laughs> Joe says, no worries. I know what you have done. Dun, dun, dun. I don't know. I'm not quite sure. Is that referring to what I did to the uh, to your house in Seven Days to Die? <laughs> I didn't do anything too bad, I think. Anyhow. Yeah, so it's toasted. That's the other thing. Like I love let's the, the going back to my frame rate constant talking about frame rate here. Here we go, John. I love it when people who come on my channel and say I hate low frame rate, you guys should die. Frame high frame rate's the future and their avatar is a is an anime drawing. And you're like, "Dude, you know anime is like 10 frames, 12 frames, maybe even lower than that, maybe one or two frames. So a second. I mean, there's animes that where all it is is the static frame and it's the mouth moves. You know, there's a lot of tricks with anime. Like, uh, basically, It's Toasted is getting, is my take on getting way, way, way too, too excited about a feature that, A, you don't really use that much, and B, no, not much. Oh, Joe said he found the mystery door. Yeah. Well, you told me to put it in there. <laughs> that, that's my door, the, the mystery door. Anyhow. So, yeah. Don't be that guy. I'm losing my train of thought. I'm tired. It's been a long day, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and uh, well, it's a long day. It's a long week. High frame rate has advantages for VFX, absolutely. Like, I agree. Like, I, I agree that... I believe that, see, the thing about, going back talking about like the 3D printed houses and stuff like that, is I'm all for technology solving problems, but we can't be a technology for technology's sake. Like if I want to solve a problem and high frame rate's a way to get to solve it, then that's the way you, that's the way you solve it. If, I, 3D, if I'm trying to make a model and I want to print a figurine and... Uh, you know, uh, and I can do it with 3D printer, then that's good. But if I can do it with a piece of wood, like, I, so the other thing I was, I was dr driving me to this point was somebody print, 3D printed one of those droids from, from Star Wars, the prequels, those little astromech droids. And I was looking at it and I thought, did, like, first of all, she said like it took like 20 days to render it or to print it up. And the, but the thing is, there's a lot of boxy shapes in it. And I thought, Man, you you could have just like that arm. You could have just taken a piece of wood and maybe sanded it down to the right proportions, or you know, woodworking would have solved a lot of that problem. You, like three D printing to me would be a complete waste of time for something like that. But what you could do is take a piece of wood and build the base out of the piece of wood, and then three D print the parts that would go on top of it, and then paint the whole thing and put it all together. I mean, the, don't let don't let the final result, which is the uh, the product. Don't let, don't forget that. That's the most important thing. How you get to that product is not so important. So, anyhow, here's a quick question: How, Will the frame rate stay 24 FPS when the world will advance to doing movies in VR? I don't think the world will advance to doing movies in VR. Like I have VR, I kind of. I, I, I haven't I haven't put on my VR set in a couple in a month or so. I, I should probably go back and play, mess with it some more. But I don't want to watch a movie in VR. Like I, I don't like I, I see no advantage. I, I see no des, no desire. I don't, I don't think VR is I don't think VR for a regular use is going to take over. I just don't like I, I see. Um, I just see that. Uh, I just I just don't see the the, the draw of it. Now VR like in K uh, J K J Q S says VR does require higher frame rate. Most native is 90 FPS. Absolutely true. And then we've uh, Joe and I have actually gone up to YouTube space and tried to work with them uh, YouTube because YouTube at one point was really pushing VR heavily. But what you find out with VR is that tr it's not traditional cinema. And I, I kind of have to remind people of this that there's a reason why you know there's oil painting and there's water painting. And they're not the same technique, right? They might, you might say, well, that's just painting, but they're not the same. 
So VR and motion picture cinema, even what you're watching now streaming, they're not the same technique. So uh, I don't see, I don't see, t I mean, okay, back it up. Uh, cinema in VR is not really cinema. And one of, that's one of the biggest problems with, you, you take away that 24 frames a second, that illusion, that kind of veneer between you and reality, and it just feels really bad. It's like well, everything I've seen in VR, unless the only good, the only good VR movies I've seen are animations. I've not seen in real. If you have like a real person acting in VR, it looks fake. It just it looks so. It looks has the same problem that high frame rate does in regular two dimensional television. It's just it's got it's got this fakeness to it. Um, so documentaries work. And I'm probably thinking like, well, what about the VR adult movies? Yeah, but they're more documentary. They're not. I mean, they are faking it, but you know, there's it's it's a different kind of faking. Anyhow, <laughs> we're going down that road. So I don't I don't think that uh, I don't think VR. I don't I don't think anyone wants to put on a VR set and watch a movie, even though I know that people do that. People sit put on a VR headset to watch a movie. To me, that's utterly pointless. Uh, utterly pointless. It, it, to me, it's it's almost uncomfortable. See, so here's where I disagree. I agree with you, but for the record, there is a, will be a convergence of film and ex real-time experiences in the future. They'll be playing films. I don't think so. Like I, I, because right now we have video games, and that's a, a, video games have essentially become playing films. I mean, like Red Dead Redemption, Grand Theft Auto, Witcher Three. They're, they're, I mean, they're the, the storytelling on that is is probably even deeper than any any video or any movie can accomplish at this point uh i just don't i don't see a convergence because there hasn't been a convergence with other other mediums either like has there been a convergence between uh like the novel and and cinema has cinema completely displaced the novel the written word no it hasn't has audio are audio books replacing the written word no they haven't so there's there are there is going to be, a, I mean, there will be a new medium of virtual reality story, but I wouldn't call that cinema. And I would, and I would even classify it as something separate and different than cinema. All right, let's see here. What do you think about the situation of Turkey cinema? I don't know the situation, so you have to inform me on that. I'm not quite sure. Yeah, about the about wear, cinema wearing goggles. It would be uncomfortable. I have to wear a mask and I can't take it off. Uh, yeah, Cuphead is makes it looks like we bring up Cuphead, which makes you look like you're playing an old cartoon. That's a the animation of Cuphead is is so good that I almost I don't want to be playing the game. I'd rather just watch the animation because it's so so clever and so well done. Right, so J Jacqueline says, cinema and paintings are interesting as an art form because 2D representation of 3D space, it would be pointless to do it in VR. It's not only pointless, but it's also, in, it, 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 that's, that's pro the problem with VR is that it, you remove that, that essence. Like with VR, you really can't do depth of field because that, that doesn't make sense in VR. You're, I mean, you're, you maybe you've had eye tracking, you could have your eyes control your depth of field, but again, that's not, that's not cinemas the depth of field controlling the depth of field is a very important artistic issue uh artistic element of cinema so is framing framing is is the ultimate tool of the photography of art of painting of any visual medium is framing if you vr you there is no framing so you you don't have that control and that you don't have it, it destroys the meaning of the medium it's like theater theater you know, if you go to theater, like why theater is so much different than film, than film storytelling. Because theater, you're watching this thing happening, occurring in front of you. Whereas in film, you're producing this experience of something that happened. There's, it's a, it's, it's a, it's simplistic to think that they're all, they're all the same when they're related, but they're not the same. So, anyhow, let's go. Sorry, I've been Luca. I've been ignoring your comment. Let's see. Uh, what was your question about AVCHD? Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, use AVCHD due to low bit rate compression inside. Oh, okay. 
So regards to um, if you're having trouble, the, 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 honestly, the best answer, if you're having trouble with your, your files not playing in your, your editing software, is to use proxies, if, if your software allows proxies. Proxies are so, so much, so easy to, so much better than trying to work with, with um, some software stuff that is not quite right. Oh, should I use AVC HD or MP4 both 1080p on my crappy camcorder? I'm, I'm not sure. I think I, I think MP4 might be a little bit easier to edit with. Um, I'd have to look into your manual, and then again, it's one of those things where you, you might notice a difference in a very, very, very fast-moving stuff. But if you're shooting like 24 frames a second, or if you're if you're shooting 60 frames a second, you might start noticing MP4 and AVAC HD may have a difference between like as what 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 frame rate you can record at. So there's that issue. Um, but it's really it's a matter of just go ahead and shoot both and test them and look at their file sizes and uh, do some maybe color correction on it and see what you think about it. All right, here we go. Now we're, we're going to talk about frame rate. Uh oh, my thing stopped. Let's see. Am I still on? Yeah. Uh, let's that. There it goes. If okay, we're gonna get some math. I need to correct you on some math now. If we publish games 120 FPS, you can have 24 five repeated frames for the story scenes and transition to 60 FPS. For the yeah, would that work? Yes, it would. Um, the problem, the only problem with that. Uh, again, gaming is different. So don't talk. Don't think about gaming. Gaming is different because you don't have uh, you don't have natural occurring motion blur. Motion blur has to be added. So if you do a 24 FPS stream in a game, you would want to add some motion blur so it doesn't look so stuttery. Um, that would help it out. But again, uh, you know, you, you don't need to get too uh, you don't need to think you don't need to think it through too hard. Like things like VSync, and I know VSync doesn't quite work. Like. You can throw VSync on your on your computer, and it will basically adjust the output of the video frame rate to your monitor. It will sync them up. However, your computer is not necessarily always delivering that VSync rate. You know, your VSync might be a 660, but your computer is only mustering 35 frames per second. But it holds the frames. You know, I don't exactly know. I don't exactly know how the math precisely works. But my impression is that it it prevents screen tearing from happening with the adjusted frame rate. So that happens naturally. So if you feed if you feed you know 24 frames a second to the to the G Sync, it's just gonna it'll put it'll display 144 frames or whatever. It'll display 90. It'll play whatever number it is, and it'll just hold the frames to to uh, create whatever kind of pull down it is to get the, so you don't have screen tearing, that kind of thing. I'm not. So anyhow, but yeah. Rocky says, you agree. For those who ask why tech becomes obsolete so quickly, it's because of planned obsolescence. Please Google it. It means they make product that last no, uh, not last for the lifetime, so people keep buying it. Uh, yeah, planned obsolescence, go, planned obsolescence goes back to the 50s-ish or so. It's not a conspiracy, though. It's just we're not going to build this thing. We're not going to build this thing to last you forever because if we do that, then we'll be out of business once everybody buys it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, there there is planned obsolescence in that the sense that they they do plan on coming out with a new version. Like Apple comes out with a new version of whatever every so often. The problem is when they force you to upgrade instead of allowing you to upgrade naturally or upgrade only when you feel like you've they, the company's actually produced a product that you want to uh, to to to, uh, to upgrade to. I wouldn't be so worried about it. It's not as nefarious. However, I mean, it is true. But then again, like, can you design something that will last forever? Probably not. So there's going to be, there's going to be a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of times to upgrade. Tech is great until you let the magic smoke escape, then it stops working. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? How is VR different? It's still a representation of something that uses narrative devices, but it's is it is very different. Um, I think we just covered about why it's different. Like composition, frame composition is one major difference. Depth of field is another major difference. Uh, again, cut cutting like cutting is 
editing is a device that you can do in two-dimensional picture and it feels very natural but cutting in a VR situation is very unnatural so there's a lot of devices in in a like it's a it, it'll be like saying that a picture is a and a sculpture are the same thing because they both represent something you be, you, you create way too much of a too generic of a uh, of a logic there and then at that point anything becomes anything Uh, question is, the uh, tools of modern motion picture live action are becoming more and more accessible. The next-gen filmmakers could be telling stories through animation or games. Yeah, the problem is it's the uh, it's never about the technology. It, and unfortunately, it never has been about the technology. And I think that the big promise of the democratization of technology, that everybody will have a story, or everybody will be able to tell their story. I mean, it's true. Everybody can hop on YouTube Live and, and start streaming. However, the audiences are not democratized. There's still that uh, is it the Pareto distribution where you have essentially the top, you know, the top 1% is like 90% of the audience is following just the one per, top 1%. So you're, that is always going to be the case, unfortunately. So no matter how, how much technology... Uh, and people are, well, people, you're asking if people are telling stories through animation. People are already doing that and through gaming. People are already doing that. So, so yeah, it's, an, it's one of those things where it's like the technology is, is great and I love it. And we, we only can do what we do right now because of technology. However, uh, it's not the panacea. It's still, it's always about the product. Uh, Sammy's, I guess, responding to the VR commentary. The cinema at every level is art. Cinema, like every art, is subjective. It's the artist's point of view. VR makes it less. Yeah, I think VR would be closer to a theatrical, like theater, like live action theater. If you were to do VR, you might want to do something more closer to a live, like a live theater kind of thing where you, you allow something to just take place in front of you. Again, like we, like I said, we we were trying to do like I, we, I've sat down and and worked with the tools and tried to figure out like how do we approach this from an artistic standpoint? And you basically have to throw out everything you know about cinema. Like all your thinking about cinema has to be changed. So it's not and at that point it's not cinema. It's just something. It's something different. And I'm not. I I, I kind of re, well, I want to resist this temptation to kind of lump everything together because it happens to be visual. Like it's it's like saying that painting and photography are the same thing. They're not the same thing. They're they're incredibly different disciplines. So VR and cinema are are very different cinemas, different disciplines. Here they go. Well, what what are the best books filmmakers should read? Uh, if I write a book, I should read mine. But and I, I have written a book, so I, I need to write one. Um, the best one of the best books I've seen are uh, Walter Murch's In the Blink of an Eye is a good one. Uh, there's a book called Seven Seas of Cinematography or something like that. And it, it, by, I, I want to say Bruce Block. So look at that. That will kind of re reorient yourself towards visual mediums. That's good for cinema. It's good for video. It's good for even art, uh, even painting and graphic arts and that stuff. I, those two books, I think, are terrific. There's a book called The History of, of Narrative Cinema by cook david cook if you're into this history that book will will fill in everything you need to know a baseline and that's a great place to facebook there yeah. lexing do you think vr might find a niche and simulate something like perspective of sitting in an imax cinema since now we have a virus no no i mean it's i think the uh, the good news is which is ironic. Okay, so you know when it's ironic how the news media and we talk about this. We'll talk about this really quickly. It's ironic how the news media will always tell you the worst, terrible story. And when the pandemic was kind of low numbers, they'll tell you it's the absolute worst thing. And then when the pandemic starts to to the, the, we hit the peak and it starts to go back down again, they'll say, "Oh, the numbers are an all time high." And the weird part about it is, it's like regardless of political affiliation, they will always make it out to be way worse than it really is. Like right now, I mean, it was really bad for in California. We went like we went really scary high, and now now it's dipping down pretty fast, almost as fast as it went up, which is I understand something that occurs 
a lot with pandemics is people don't really understand understand why that happens. So, uh, yeah, I, I think sometime this year, movie theaters will probably be open again. I would say probably summertime in, in well, summertime for us, be July. It's probably when we start opening things up again. And I think, I think the good news is I think it'll, the recommendation will be wear a mask if you want to. I think a lot of people will. And, and I think, importantly, we should not be penalizing people that want to wear a mask. Because in Asia, they wear masks all the time. It's totally okay. So I think mask wearing will be kind of around for a long time. I don't know if it will be mandatory by the end of the year. Maybe it will still be in during the summertime. But that's my prediction. And I'm sure you guys all came on to see my prediction. I'm sure none of you came on to see my prediction. Yeah. How, how do you compose a frame? How? Oops. So my computer is still struggling with this thing, huh? Okay. Well, not good to know. I'm going to probably have to... Uh, there you go. Probably going to have to re... I'm going to rebuild the hard drive on this thing. How do you compose a frame when the viewer can be looking literally anywhere. And that is the, that is the trick with VR. And the way you compose a frame in, uh, is the same way you do it in the video games. And it's actually the same way magicians do it when they do in sleight of hand, is they attract your attention towards something and that makes you look at that. Now, of course, there's always gonna be some nut, some little a-hole kids like, I'm not gonna look over there, I'm gonna look over there. Uh, you know, there's always gonna be that. But if you can do that psychologically, and then attract your attention to the what you want them to look at. That's how you. That's how the. That's the art of VR. Again, that's this. This is like this is like we need to get into the deep philosophy of how to tell stories in VR. It's not that deep. This is kind of surface level stuff. Um, but if you just say cinema and VR are the same thing, no, they're not. No, they're not. You need to go the next layer underneath that. Well. And then they say, well, it's all art, though. We're not arguing it's not all art. No one's arguing that. The thing is, there are different kinds of art and different ways to approach these mediums. And they can't just say, well, you know, I'm, I, I make sculpture and therefore I can paint. No, they're not. It's like you know, they're dis different disciplines. Do you th don't you think it's about time camera manufacturers started accepting, adopting NDI and also perhaps allow power over IP as well? Yeah, I mean, I got the. I, I, it bugs me that these IP cameras that I have are. I have to pay an extra thousand dollars to 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 enable NDI. Um, but you know, I, I don't know what the story is. I don't. Uh, uh, NDI might be a proprietary technology, and maybe that's why it doesn't allow it. Power over Ethernet. Power over Ethernet. I mean, sure. I mean, that's why I, I love powering my uh, my IP cameras that way. So I have no, I mean, yeah, sure. But the thing is, you know, like cameras that are meant for studio environments, a lot of them have that NDI capability, you know. And then cameras that are used for, for on-location shooting, there's no point in adding that stuff. Like why would you put a NDI, NDI on, a, uh, on a photo camera that's like a, like, a, uh, like a Canon, you know, 5D or something? Why would you want that? It'd just be an extra port and an extra space. So... But you're right, yeah. I mean, it would be nice for studio setups to have NDI. Uh, if you're just watching a movie, in then you're just watching a movie in a virtual environment. The medium hasn't changed, just the setting. Oh, if you're just watching it. Yeah. But, you know, I'd rather not have something on my face when I'm watching a movie. I already have glasses. I don't need, to, like, a thing on my face. And then have to deal with the, the you know, the kind of, the, the somewhat of the eye strain of it. Anyhow, do you think the increased energy usage associated with 60 FPS is stream or, or stream is worth the environment? I, I don't think the environmental impact is, I think it's absolutely negligible for 60 FPS 4K video. I think there's, I mean, there's something, what's, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a self avowed I will go so far on the line to say I'm a self avowed capitalist entirely. So, the the um, the cost of the extra energy usage is should be factored in by the cost of the electricity, and if the cost of electricity outweighs then the the benefit of it, then it doesn't happen. So yeah, I, I don't I'm not concerned about the energy usage. I'm, you know, like I, I'm 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 very 
cautious about energy usage in terms of like practical energy. Like I hate the idea of, I like the energy of reusing stuff. So like my set behind me is a lot of it's, like half of it's reused from the old set. I, I, I don't like to throw anything away. <laughs> oh, thank you. I love the IQ series. Thank you for teachings and the way you explain it. I, I appreciate it. This morning, I, there's, a, there's another channel out there that I forgot the name of it, but I, I, I saw his video about an, about anamorphic lenses. And I forget. I, I, I follow his channel. He, he, and I watched it. He did this thing where he did this Matrix uh, thing. Where he did, the, he put himself in the matrix, not the matrix, Blade Runner. He put himself in Blade Runner, and I watched it. And I was like, "Man, this is so good!" And I felt bad. I'm like, "I'm not doing anything close to that level." This guy is knocking it out of the park. Uh, cine, I think it's cinema, cine, no, it's not cinematography based database. It's something else. It's it's. Uh, he has an accent. I, he does. He used to do a lot of videos about like really large format. He actually was the reason why I got into four by five. He kind of made me think about four by five. So, um, yeah, the guy is, uh, the guy, like his video on anamorphic, I haven't watched it yet, but it, it made me feel bad. Like, man, he's, this is so damn good. And I'm not, I'm sitting here talking to you. I mean, not that I don't want to be talking to you guys, but like, I'm just, I bear can have a hard time writing stuff. <laughs> I don't know. I was, I've been, I've been stressed. Let's be honest. In my opinion, what's movie has the most beautiful cinematography? Uh, the fall as a not the fall is it the fall it's the one with that or ah uh, shoot is um you guys in chat will probably know what i'm talking about it's the one that it's based on a like a story about a, a girl like a girl's talking to a, a guy who's like in a fever dream and she's talking he's thinking about all these these uh amazing these this amazing story i think it's called the fall and then a lot of it's shot in india and it's some just amazing cinematography in, in india and the movie was an independent movie that cost $150 million and it was a big, big, big bomb. But it's beautiful and it deserves more views. It's so good. Well, the story is okay, but the cinematography is so good. It's kind of like, if you guys remember that movie, um, oh shoot, the, the Cell. Like The Cell had a lot of the similar similar cinematography where it's it's got that that Indian, uh, Indian architecture, Indian art, artistry to it. For a Westerner, it's it's exotic and very cool looking. I don't know. All right. Uh, I'm always... The mission of cinema, I always somehow relieve my stress and give me inspiration back. All the stuff is informative and nice. Stay safe. Oh, thank you. I hope I... I mean, I hope to try to bring some level of sanity. <laughs> uh, just, just trying to, you know, like... I. I just gotta make more stuff. Right now, I'm just I'm I'm in a very bad mental state. I'm just like depressed all the time. So I'm trying to claw my way out of there. Am I familiar with Brazilian cinema? No, I'm not. Sorry. Uh, let's see. Have I directed a feature before? Have I directed a feature? If not, that's something that you're interested in someday. Yes. The problem is though, I am a, I I don't want to direct a feature unless it's a pr unless it's good. Because, I mean, if, it, like, I could go out and shoot a feature, but it wouldn't be very good. It might, and it would just be, like, a cobbled together thing. And I, I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, there's probably, there's probably an advantage that I should probably do that anyway, just to make a feature so I can have, so I can get a sense of, of the whole landscape of a feature. But it is such a big investment in time. And, and knowing my, knowing my own personality is, like, I, I wouldn't be comfortable making something that long form. And not being everything that I could put into it, you know. So, I mean, I've made, like, almost feature-length videos on this channel about, like, the studios. And that nearly killed me. <laughs> oh, you can hear my 3D printing. Yeah, it's printing out a uh, uh, figurine of a red, ri red riding hood. A somewhat sexy red riding hood, I gotta admit. Kind of sexy. But she's got a wolf with her. With the printing pieces. Did you see the Pocket 6K announcement? Oh, no, I had not heard about it. I'll check it out. I don't know idea what, what that... I, I, might, I, I might be renting one of those in the future. I got an idea for a video involving one of their cameras and the... Um, dyna what was it called? The clip restoration? Clipping restoration? Because there's a lot of people talking um, on my dynamic range videos. People don't understand that the clip restoration does not do what you think it does. And I'm actually trying to find it out on, on the... 
on on what the what they say on uh, what some of the black magic folks have been saying on other channels like like uh, Gerald Undone. How do you th how do you think a uh, AI is going to directly affect stories, characters, and plot, or maybe it's already started as studios using AI to decide which scripts become a movie. I don't know. Like I, like I think the problem with AI though is we have to. I mean, let, the, the, let's talk about the big AI that we that we are all under the thumb of right now, and that's the algorithm that YouTube is running. That's AI, Facebook AI. So it's learning and and trying to figure out what's best for you. Is that a good thing? I mean, and how does that affect our our career? I mean, for YouTubers, it's like YouTubers keep talking about the algorithm, how to please the algorithm, make a comment, you know, make a thumbnail that's, that the algorithm recognizes. It becomes where slaves are ready to the algorithm, slaves to the AI. So I'm, I'm not sure, you know. I don't know. I kind of feel like we need to just get back to kind of humanity and just making stories. And realize that the AI does affect all that. Um, so maybe, I don't know. I, I would bet you, though, that if, if Hollywood, if AI ran Hollywood, you'd see a lot more sequels and a lot more. Because it's all, because it, cause it, AI would just be like A-B testing constantly. Like, oh, you want to do some another sequel? Anyhow, I don't know. Oh, thank you. Found the channel seven, eight years ago. Yeah, well, thanks for watching. We can't believe we've been around for that long. Micro LED will change how we see screens. With the head tracking, we could build an at-home curved display large enough to experience VR experiences if the display technology is cheap enough. Oh, cool. Yeah, the thing is, you know, but the other thing, like, the other thing you wonder too, okay, so you've, let's say you were, I'm going to push back on your comment. Make you th just Let's think about it for a sec. Let's say you were to build a wall, an entire wall that's an LED, you know, like a big old wall in your home, like Fahrenheit 451 style. And then you would then you would sit down and watch it, but then you would realize that ninety eight percent of the time you're staring at just this little portion of the wall, like that corner of the wall. You never ever look at that corner. You really just look at this this center section. So then you ask yourself, why did I build this whole wall when I really only care about this portion of it? I don't really like that. I don't actually watch that portion. So I'm wondering, like, if if uh, you know. Even if with the VR, do we need it? Do we even want it? Or is it just is it just because it's cool and then as soon as it's no longer cool, we don't use it? I don't know. Uh, let's see. I, was, I I've been I was going jumping ahead to your chats here. All right. Do you do you think we can just code the characters' wants and needs in the story settings, and a movie gets made instantly with animation? How far away, how far away are we? That's a good question. Uh, you could probably do that with uh, you could probably do that with text, I imagine. Yeah, I wonder if you could. I wonder if like some game mechanics too. You know, like if you build a game, and just have the characters have a characters' wants and needs, like you know, that could be uh, an element in gamification of it. Sure. Um, but, I, you know, I think I'm wondering if if the whole point of art, though, is not necessarily just to create stories, but to have create sto stories that explain something to someone else. You know, I mean, maybe this is, might be getting a little bit deeper and philosophical about it, but that uh, like you don't really want um like movies are a way of humans, well, all art is a way of kind of trans, uh, passing on emotions from one person to another, and so the question. I mean, this is now we're getting to sci-fi territory, and hey, you can make a movie about this, you know. Like, uh, do we really want to watch movies that AI make? Do they really want to make movies? That, will we get something out of a movie that an AI made? Or will it just be superficial? You know, it goes back to the 1984 book where the the poor lady is humming a song that an AI composed. You know, a computer composes melody, but she's humming along to it. I don't, you know, I don't know. It may could be. I mean, I don't, that that that's the subject for for intense uh, 
intense story sci-fi telling how far away are we away from it i think probably quite quite significantly far away from it because i think there's a lot of complications that we haven't even thought about uh let's see uh jumping ahead okay so i shot a feature over the course of a year with no budget and turned out okay mostly it was great learning experience and the way to develop my style yeah thing is like I, I i think i know what my style is that's i've made enough shorts to know what i want to do that's the thing like I, I i so like i've made i made and i put some significant time into making my shorts so like if i if i didn't make them the quality of the shorts that i produced then it wouldn't be it would be a step back for me and i don't want to put that time into something that would be a step back not that i don't want to make a feature film because i really do Okay, good VR content has to give you a reason to turn your head. Most creators have have been introduced to its workflow and technique, yet when the masses have it, it will be at its place, in my opinion. Exactly. Yeah, the um, but there's there's one, like, when YouTube did their VR stuff, there was this one uh, VR that was really hyped. Basically, it was kind of like one of those like, five, day, five Nights at Freddy's kind of videos where they have... Um, you were you were in a hall and you were watching these four monitors on screen and then it was a horror. I have to pronounce that properly. It was a horror show, horror movie, and you're watching these four angles on a on a screen. And then because they they want to show off VR, they put four more screens directly behind you that you had to like you had to turn your head in order to to see the story. And I thought this is incredibly uncomfortable. Can you imagine a going to a cinema where you had to turn your head to get the rest of the story? Like, it's annoying. <laughs> like, I want VR to be this part. And that's why I think a lot of, a lot of video, like a lot of th stuff that's, that's the VR experiences are 180 degrees or maybe, you know, 170 degrees. Just this, because I can look, I can look around. Because I don't really care what's back there. It's not important to me. So I think a lot of the stuff that's that's um, VR is uh, is is that is just focusing on that direction. Is mental health assistance at the base of an AI algorithm? I I don't think so. <laughs> uh, you want to invoke meaning and emotion in any narrative format. Agreed. Agreed. The thing is, I think what you're what you're doing, and I, maybe I'm maybe I'm misrepresenting your comments here, but you're you're re making everything very reductive, and we're not arguing that VR is not art. I'm just arguing that VR is not cinema, and it's like saying that water painting is the same thing as oil painting. And they both have the same objectives. They have totally different disciplines. I truly believe theater actors have more practice, in, more place in VR because to capture it, the crew largely has to disappear. These actors also lend their talents to live experiences, much different skills. Exactly. And also, if you ever take theater actors and bring them into a film environment, they don't fit in. They don't, like, they literally have to, they change the way they think uh, entirely. I remember one of my favorite shows recently was watching Amazon's Bosch and Titus Welliver. I was watching an interview with him, and Tyus Welver has a, uh, become a hero of mine because of his portrayal of Bosch. He comes from theater, and so he was talking about the first time he was on a movie set, and, and they come to him like, like, Titus, we like what you're doing, but you got to remember, I'm working with this. I'm not, so you need to bring your movement down to this, not up here, this. <laughs> So that's why cinema, again, that's why cinema and theater and VR are, are such different different things. And VR filmmaking is in its infancy. It is still the same stage as when the first cre created the very first shorts with no sound. Not really. I mean, it, yes, it is in its infancy. I agree with that. But however, we have to, re we have to realize it's going to be its own creation. It's going to be its own child. So you can't say, well, cinema and VR, same thing. Nope. It's going to be its own own thing to be explored. Here, let's go back here. I often, Adam continues, I often hear you mention the cinema, at, about the cinema, but as the pandemic had shown, features would just be released online. I think home theater might kill cinema and therefore VR could eventually work. I don't think so. 
Like I, th- I have a feeling that when when the when theaters open back up again, there might be there might be a big boom for them because people will be like, I'm sick of being at home. I want to get out. I think part of the theater experience too, and I, I know people will push back on that, is I think the shared experience of being in a room with other people, strangers watching something is significantly different than watching something at home in the home theater. And again, people like me too, like I just don't have the space in my home for a home theater. Um, I just don't. I, I would have to put a major investment. I would have to totally clear things out. And my own personality is I don't want to throw away an old TV that works perfectly well. And I don't want to, I don't want to just junk it. Um, but there's a lot of people that, that are not going to ha- want home theater setups. Um, and I think a lot of people also, I mean, people might buy big TVs, but again, as, as more and more people, you know, cut down the number of stuff in their house or have smaller homes, smaller living spaces, they may not want the, you know, going to the theater, you get the big experience and you get the, the crowd experience. Yep. And there it goes. London Sound Factory, VR and theater are two separate art forms. Yep, Exactly. That's what uh, I think that uh, what I guess what I'm fighting back right now is that there's a tendency to want to equate VR to something else. And you got to stop that. You got to stop thinking that. Like I literally I I I've, I've gone and have tried I've th- I've thought to myself, "Well, I know how to make films. I'm going to I'm going to step into VR and make make something really g- amazing." And I and I set, sat down and tried to look at VR and I realized how this is my my filmmaking stuff. My, my filmmaking approach does not work in VR. It just doesn't. Uh, it totally, it totally, uh, totally breaks, really. So that's when I was like, well, I'd rather focus on my filmmaking than VR. That's kind of where I came to the conclusion. And we are so keen on making things old in order to embrace the new. We are so keen on making things o- into old in order to embrace the new, yeah. <laughs> it might be hard to predict, but people are happy to watch Avenger films on on a phone. Have you ever seen that? Uh, ever seen that David Lynch thing? Uh, the David Lynch fake Apple ad. He's like he's on, he's talking on a mic. He says, "If you think you're watching a movie on your damn phone, you're fucking full of shit," or something like that. <laughs> it cuts to cuts to the iPhone logo. Yeah. I don't think I would not be perfectly happy watching an Avengers film on a phone. I'm not even perfectly happy watching an Avengers film on on my home TV. Uh, it just not it's just not the same. Like maybe and you know I, I don't know like I I uh, I can watch movies on my phone. Obviously, I have the phone, but I I would rather wait till I get home and watch it on my screen at home than watch it on my phone. But there are some things, you know, I guess some things that I would watch on a phone. Again, I don't know. I, I, there's, oh, my phone's going crazy now. All right, I, all right. As I touched my phone, it's going crazy. What's my dream? How do I get inspired? I dream of Genie. And I, I think the ultimate dream for any content creator is to just be able to make the content they, they want to make. And I would love to be able to get there. I don't know how. And even then, I don't know what kind of like, what kind of content do you want to make. I, I mean, I have an idea what I, what I would love to make if I had like infinite money. But again, I don't have infinite money, and if I did, I probably would squander it anyway. <laughs> the uh, there's a George Orson, not George Orson, Orson Welles quote that says, uh, "And the uh, limit 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 or having no limitations is the enemy of art." And I think, unfortunately, as much as I hate the fact that I have to struggle even to, to do anything these days. It's like the only, that's the only thing that I can, that I can have, that can, that keeps me motivated is, is limitation, which sucks because I want no limitations. And I don't, I don't always play the lottery. Occasionally I do, but man, I spend hours dreaming about what I would do if I got the lot, one lottery. And, but honestly, but be honest, it wouldn't be better. I'd face the same challenges now, just I'd have more money. <laughs> just different challenges, more money, more problems. Do, you know what would make you feel better? Shooting some four by five. Nay, you got, you got, a, you got, yeah, you, you got me. Actually, I need to develop some color film too. So I got. So those are two things that would make me feel better. 
I prefer viewing is on a tablet. I find it odd to watch a theater TV. Uh, tablet, I've got the Amazon Fire tablets. Those are pretty inexpensive and they're pretty good looking. Um, yeah, I just haven't, I'd rather watch it on a big TV. Again, preferences, man. Everyone's got their own preferences. One critic claimed that uh, Joe Dorowski mastered the 4x3 format. What are the cinematic screen formats that we explore? You know what else is 4x3? Have you guys seen this? The Justice League movie. <laughs> that blew my mind. The Zack Snyder's Justice League cut, the Zack Snyder cut, is four by three. Can you believe that? So I was watching it. I was watching the, the trailer, and, and I was like, this feels off. Why did Warner Brothers release a four by three trailer? Is this a like a throwback? Te- no. The film was shot in four by three. Justice League is the same, is closer to aspect ratio to the lighthouse. Can you blows your mind is that funny because because i i think Zack snyder was saying that he framed a lot of the shots for four by three so when joss whedon came in and recomposed it for i think 1.85 or 2.39 or whatever it was it was the final justice league movie was in he killed a lot of the compositions and that's why he's like well that's really upset me that's why this the snyder cut so go figure man four by three dude crazy there may be maybe fewer ass shots of Wonder Woman's ass the way Joss Whedon uh, framed it because Joss Whedon has a yeah he has he has a if you ever read Joss Whedon's like Wonder Woman script it's kind of creepy <laughs> it's kind of creepy uh, no yeah Adam says well, I th- just thought that was a trailer no the film is actually four by three at least the, there's large sections I may maybe parts of it are not four by three but yeah it's four by three it's crazy. So yeah, I'll give. I mean, I'm not super excited about Justice League because I mean we saw just Joe and I saw Justice League and it was okay. Eh, I wasn't. I didn't hate it. it. I thought it was better than Bats vs Superman. I thought that was Bats vs Superman was dreary. Um, but Justice League is uh, it's okay. It's a big blow up. So I might give the Justice League a, a, a another chance. But. I'm not super excited about it. I'm like, oh, we live in a society, and i got to check this out. <laughs> you know. Uh, what advice would I give a 20-year-old filmmaker? I would give the advice I give everybody is to don't give up and just keep keep doing it. Keep going for it, man. Just just make stuff. Constantly make stuff. And don't, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. And boy, am I need to learn that. I need to learn that so hard. Believe me, I, I am such a, I, I've, I've built into myself a perfectionist streak, which is very, very bad. And I feel very horrible about it. I feel horrible based generally all the time because I don't feel like I'm doing, I'm not reaching my, my full potential. But that's, all, that's just me yelling at myself. That sucks. Anyhow, don't do, don't be me. Go out and make stuff. Make something. Make something great. Make something not so great. Doesn't matter. Just make something. That's all it does. Because the next thing you make will be better. That's the way it always works. The next thing you make is always better. And that's just the way it is. Uh, if you haven't checked it out, Oculus Venues, they create digital cinemas, group of people watching. T- yeah, I know. I, 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 I've seen it. I've got an Oculus uh, Rift, no, no, I have Oculus Quest 2. I just don't want to watch. I mean, I've seen it, but I don't, uh, it's, eh. <laughs> no, no, I just, uh, yeah. What chemical do I use for C41? Um, I just got this stuff. Uh, what's the name of this? It's a very common one. It's the, it comes in the red packaging. It's the it's it's two chemicals. Uh, I forget I forget the name of it. I, I haven't even opened it yet. I haven't even tried it out out yet. So I haven't even done it. It's not Kodak. It's it's that it's probably the biggest independent company out there that does that does. Uh, what you call it c41 chemistry it'd be fun i just uh i was telling my friend joe the other day i was like i just i was painting a, a um some 3d prints that i had and uh, unfortunately i did a pretty bad job so i tried to i'm trying to re- repaint them but when i was a kid i was a big fan of I, I, I did models like 3d not 3d models but like you know plastic models i would paint them with oil paints and stuff like that testers oil paints that was my jam, right? I was like, and I kind of, I kind of looked down on acrylics. Like acrylics are for babies. Oil paints are for real grown-ups like me. I'm, 
I'm for 15 years old. I'm going to use oil paints. And now that I'm 30, uh, thir approaching 39, I'm looking at acrylics and I'm like, damn, why didn't I use acrylics earlier? Because acrylics, I can wash them with water. Oh, I can wash acrylics with water. That makes it so much easier. And then I've noticed the crooks that I bought, they smell super nice. They, they, they've got this really pleasant, like, soft smell. They don't have this, you know, oils have a very, have that acetone, acetate, ugh, nail polish smell. But acrylics got this, this kind of pleasant smell to them. Why haven't I been using acrylics? That's what I mean. Like, I, as I get older, like, I, I become more interested in the final result or, or the ease of use and stuff like that than I am in, in whatever, you know, perceived quality of oil painting versus acrylics i much prefer acrylics man way more oh yeah cine still dolar yeah cine still I, I couldn't think of it just like i can't think of the name of half of the actors i think of when i <laughs> uh how good of a film can one make with a sony a7 III? you can make as good a film as you can put in front of it like once you you know the the big the uh, the, the big problem with the big problem with uh, independent film, amateur film, is not so much the camera technology, it's what you put in front of the camera. Like, if you think about it, like, you know, how much does a red camera cost? How much does an, even how much does it cost to rent an airy camera, right? It costs, what, six, seven thousand dollars a week? Maybe more than that? If you want to get a whole package, I'm trying to get stuff or organized here, sorry guys. Yeah, it costs maybe six or seven thousand dollars a week, ten thousand dollars a week or so. Let's just say, let's just give yourself ten thousand dollars a week to. Um, what am I doing here? Come on, John. Let's give ourselves ten thousand dollars a week to work with, for renting a camera package. How much do you think it costs to build a set? <laughs> you know, uh, I don't know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars to build like a, a medical set, like a doctor's, like a like ER room filled with props. How much does it cost to pay the actors to, to fill the scene? It's a lot more. So the, the end up, they realize the end of the day, the, uh, the, qu the camera is like one of the smaller costs involved with a big, real big film. So That was my jam, Mo Money, Mo Pobs, and my closet hip hop head. I am a closet hip hop artist. I go by the name uh, John Diddy. As in John Diddy, your mom. Ah, ha, ha, ha. Oh my God, that's just terrible. Sorry. <laughs> apologize for all that. Apologize. It is Black History Month. I apologize in advance. I apologize for existing. How's that? There you go. How many years shall I spend lear it learning? You will spend your entire life learning. You will never ever stop learning. So I'm sorry. <laughs> this is a I, uh, this is a lifelong lifelong pursuit. Unfortunately. Is there a topic you would like to do as far as videos? Um, I got a chalkboard full of them. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Uh, I, I prefer comedy. I was thinking about, I, I was listening to an interview that, uh, about a woman who worked at, on the Jay Leno's TV set as a writer, Jay Leno's late night show as a writer. And she was talking about how much fun it was working on that show because every day was full of laughter. Like you would just show up to work and then you would, you know, it'd be hard. There'd be long hours, but you were like sitting there, you'd laugh, you'd be laughing because they're, they're telling jokes. They're, they're trying to have fun. And, you know, that's, that's to me, like I, I'm thinking to myself, like I, that's the, that's the world I want to be in. I want to be in the laughter, like go to work and, and laugh and have fun. So are we talking about LOLing about, oh, maybe LOLing about my uh, terrible jokes, but, uh, yeah, so that's why I, I, I'm attracted to comedy. Oh, testers wear enamels? I don't know the difference. <laughs> I don't know. They, they, you had to use thinner for the, some of those tester oil paints. I don't know. Maybe, maybe they've changed them. I don't know. What do I know? I was 15 at the time. I, I just was like, I don't, wanna, I don't want painters to wash up with water. That's too, that's too easy. I want to have to use thinner. <laughs> so... I think this question gets asked all the time. What's my favorite movie of all time? Your number one in a list is Doctor Strange Love. You guys got you guys got that one. Uh, here you go. Why haven't such films become more freaking? Do you think it's due to the Bombay Velvet flop? Oh, I'm, I must be referencing to something else you wrote. 
Uh, let's see. Oh, there you go. To be fair, honest, oil paint should only smell like in linseed oil, which is a very nice smell. The solvents used are bad smells. Okay. If you use 100% pure turpentine, smells like pine forest. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I, I've got some acetone that I was cleaning my hands with, and that just smells rotten. <laughs> well, not rotten. It's It makes you really, really high. <laughs> there you go. Good advice. Stay curious all your life. Many great things in the world are lifelong learners, also cur always curious, even up to their old age. Question is, how much would it be to rent a green screen studio about 200 square feet? Now, the problem is, 200 square feet for a green screen studio is not that big. Let's see, well, let's uh, calculate 200. So if you're, if you're thinking square, f square foot, it's what, about 14 feet square? That's like a small room. You're not going to get really good green screen out of that. You need like a lot more space. Like a proper green screen. If you want to rent like a proper green screen studio, you're looking at maybe four or 500 square feet at least, I think. If you want to like, now we're talking about like a, a green psych, which is like a, a green screen that goes from the floor to the ceiling, right? Um, if you want, if you want that full studio green screen thing, you'd probably at least need 500 square feet, 400, 500 square feet would be probably reasonable. The bigger, the better, because the more space you have, the more distance you can put between your green screen and you, and where you can put the camera and, and the subject matter. Um, the problem is uh, most people don't have that space. Now the thing, the, the, the flip back, you don't necessarily need that much space if you're framing, a, if you're not framing a full body shot. If you're framing torso up, you just need a, a screen in the back. You can get away with, you know, hardly any space at all. So there's lots of things you can do without a uh, screen. A 20 by 10 foot feel. So yeah, 20 by 10 feet would be 200 square feet. But the thing is, 10 feet is not enough space for... The camera. I mean, I'm assuming you're, you're probably including the like if the, if the actual green screen itself was 10 feet by 20. Okay, that'd be big enough. But the studio space would need to be bigger than that because you need to put the camera somewhere. Um, so, but as far as how much is it rent? Uh, check out PeerSpace.com. PeerSpace.com is sort of like a Airbnb, but for production spaces. And they may not be in your city, or they may or may not be in your city. Um, I found some green screen spaces that you can rent for about, for as low as like $50 an hour, you know, but it's very, very minimal. Um, you can rent, this is one set in LA that, is, that looks exactly like the Batman, the Batcave from, from the Dark Knight, you know, with the white, with the light uh, panels on, uh, on the ceiling. They might have used it for the Batcave for that particular shot. I don't, I don't know. Or they may have built it to make it look like the Batcave. I'm not sure which one is, but that goes for like a thousand dollars a day, which is not that much if you're, you know, if you're if you're in a serious budget territory. If you're, if you're, not, if you're not like funding it out of your pocket, thousand dollars a day is not terribly expensive for a, for this studio. But uh, Peer Space, PeerSpace.com, check it out. You might you might be able to find. I think a lot of Airbnbs use it too to kind of rent out their Airbnbs to. Um, yeah, I actually saw. There, there was an adult movie that I saw. I'm like, hey, I recognize that, <laughs> that patio. And I found it. It was this Hollywood Hills mansion. And like, hey, I reckon that fountain is the same fountain. And then the shrubberies are the same as this adult. Okay, never mind. <laughs> We're getting in trouble now. Why am I so handsome and magical? Are you on shrooms? <laughs> uh Ignoring money and getting qualified people, what is the perfect crew size in your experience? I have no experience on that. The perfect crew size? There is no perfect crew size. I mean, that's, like, I, I, would, I would not know. Um, for like a small number of people, you know, like you, you, should have, you should have people filling all the positions that you need to fill. So we can, I guess we can answer that question that way. Uh, you should have a cinematographer. Usually your camera should have at least two or three people operating camera, like either cinematographer, assistant camera, and maybe another person to do uh, like a second AC or something like that. Ideally, that, that would be the best because one, one person would be uh, kind of overseeing DP kind of camera operations. Another person would be pulling focus and the third person would be doing the camera reports, writing down stuff and then doing the clapper and stuff like that. 
So three people on the camera crew, you know, at least have one or two one or two people handling sound. Um, if you need a boom and a mixer or just you know, one person probably could be good enough for sound. Uh, probably uh, like electrician, someone just to manage the lighting. And maybe an electrician would have like maybe a couple grips with them. So maybe two, two additional people. Uh, then you would have to have, uh, that would cover your sound. And um, you have a couple of PAs just to do stuff, you know, three or four people, three, three PAs would be ideally, would be good. And then a couple of grips to just move stuff, I guess. I don't know. Now we're, I'm just throwing, pick, picking, throwing stuff at you. Uh, you have your director, obviously, an assistant director, kind of help manage the floor. Um, uh, another uh, story script supervisor would be very useful just to keep an eye on things, make sure, make sure things are running smoothly. So there you go. That's a skeleton crew there of, you know, oh, makeup artists. We didn't talk about them. So at least at least one makeup artist for maybe three or four people for three or four actors. You know, if you need to have many, many multiple leads, maybe you get a couple makeup artists. What else is there? Uh, lighting, sound. Uh, what else do we do? Camera. I forget. So I don't know. 30. 30 would be very, very efficient, I think. But of course, it depends on how, how big the production gets. You know, the bigger they are. Uh, Scorsese has been noted to say that when he, he, like working on the big movies that he has to work on now, that have to, there's so many layers and so many people that it's hard to move through. Anyhow, your opinion on 1917. I thought that was a great movie. I saw it twice. I thought it was amazing. Very well done. Would disappearance of movie theaters decrease your passion for filmmaking? Yeah, it has during the COVID, honestly. I mean, we can't even make movies right now, technically. But, you know, I, I, don't, think they will, I don't think they will disappear entirely. They might decrease in a number of them, and that's fine. You don't need to have 10 theaters servicing a city. You can have two or three. That's fine. Oh, there you go. I think I saw Taz... Lo Ty Lopez's mansion in a film somewhere also. Yeah, he rented that mansion. <laughs> you can and you can rent these these homes out, you know, and they're not terribly expensive to rent. I've always wanted a big house like that, but I keep thinking to myself, well, do I really want a big house or do I just want a very nice house and a nice small space, you know? Uh, let's see. We are on the a same age and doing almost the same thing. Oh, I'm going to cross the ocean in Europe. So I, I, I was trying, trying to do a little earlier stream for you guys in Europe. So it's a little bit, uh, I usually stream around four here, but now it's 1230 and actually I get going pretty soon. Are you interested in astrophotography? A little bit. I just haven't spent much time in it. It, it, it takes a lot of night, a lot more time than I have. And I have to get outside of where I live because it's kind of uh, a lot of light pollution around here. Opinions of the man are the films aside. Do you think the notion of Snyder Cut is a positive win for the artist or a dangerous precedent for unstable films and lack studio accountability? I don't know. I, I I don't really, I don't see one movie as any any trend. I just you know it just happened to be. I think what happened was HBO Max, HBO or Warner Brothers started HBO Max and HBO Max and they thought, well we need more content and we could probably give Zack Snyder. 20, I don't know, was it $20 million, $30 million to take this movie and remake it, you know, because there's a, there's a popular thing about the Snyder Cut, you know, and have him remake it, and uh, why not? It's the same thing with, I mean, it's the same thing that's been happening with Blade Runner for, how many versions of Blade Runner are there? You know, it's been, ha since the 1980s, there's like five different Blade Runners. How many Apocalypse Now? There's like a, there's like a dozen, of, a couple, well, not a dozen, but there's a couple different variations of Apocalypse Now. A couple different, you know, directors' cuts and all that. So I don't think this is definitely that much different. I think it's more of a publicity stunt for Warner Brothers to say, "Hey, check out Warner Brothers oh, HBO Plus because we got the Snyder cut, and you can you can only watch it here." You know, that kind of thing. That's all it is. Uh, let's see. What are great examples of experimental films? I don't know them all off of my head that many, but uh, check out David Lynch's Elephant Man. It's pretty experimental. Uh, there's a couple classic, um, classic, like, what is it called? Kirikwamsat, whatever. It's an experimental film with no narrative. It's just beautiful imagery and maybe some connective tissue. Um, 
those are some great examples. Uh, I forget the name. How did, I can't even pronounce it. Kuna Quonsat, whatever. I don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> I watched it once. I thought it was really good. But I, uh, I didn't get that into it. Um, yeah, David Lynch did some experimental stuff. And basically, experimental stuff is not mainstream. So you have to be on the lookout for that. What's my opinion of the Criterion Collection not releasing 4K at home media? Well, I don't know. I don't, I don't know quite know how 4K media is. I, I Honestly, I don't even been keeping track on exactly how to even deliver 4K media. I think Blu-ray can do it. But, you know, Criterion Collection is there. I'm sure they will... I, I will leave it to the Criterion Collection because I think they have the best interest of the viewer at, at heart. I think that they are the film ultimate film geek, film lovers. And if they're not doing something, it's, there's a reason why they're not doing it. Whether it's because... Um, whether it's because technicality or because they can't get the prints or the tech, you know, whatever it is. Oh yeah. Th there's three Blade Runner cuts and three apocalypse now. So you're saying 70, 75 million to finish the end of the Snyder cut could make a whole new movie. Well, not, you couldn't make a justice league movie for $70 million because those movies cost like $200 million. So maybe it was a, maybe it was a, uh, maybe it was a discount. I don't know. You know, $70 million for, for a comic book movie, would not, you can't make a comic book movie for that little. Unless you're David Sandberg. Maybe he made it. Maybe he made Shazam for that much. Okay, what, is, what about success? Is it chance or work? You have to... You, success is a matter of luck and preparation, as they say. As Edison, I think, said. It's when, when inspiration meets perspiration. Well, that's something different. It's both. It's you have to you have to be willing to put in the work and then get lucky. And that's how you do it. Do I think the WB is in trouble by pissing off their creators like Nolan with HBO Max shift, or do you think they'll be okay? They gotta fight it out, you know. Um, I personally am not. I don't. I am not in favor of the whole idea of releasing this, the releasing the movie at home and in theaters at the same time. I see, I understand it, but I think for sure it's a detrimental, it is, it is hurtful for the theaters to have it streaming at home at the same time. The question is how big a dent does it make in the box office? Does it make a 50% dent or does it make a 2% dent? It makes a dent. There's no question about it, but I don't know how much. So maybe we'll, we'll find out. Um, I think maybe the pandemic will show us that we actually do want to go back and be with people rather than stay at home. So... Oh, Deadpool. The first, first one was $58 million. Cool. Yeah, so, I mean, that's Deadpool. Oh, my, my thing's being crazy. Yeah, Deadpool is also was done on the cheap. <laughs> you can't make a Justice League movie for $58 million. Films by our tours. You're just, you're just asking me a bunch of questions that are uh, on, your, on your essay, homework essay, right? Films by our tours versus multiple voices. I think film is medium of I think auteur theory is is false I don't I don't believe I I think auteur theory is uh is is a bunch of bunk I think uh I think people talk about how like Orson Welles made this cut here no Orson Welles didn't make a cut someone else made the cut Orson Welles approved it if he had prob Orson Welles had a problem with it he would have told them and they would have changed it but that's the thing like Tim Burton or, you know or Tim Burton movie or even Christopher Nolan Christopher Nolan doesn't cut the movie Someone else cuts the movie, you know. Uh, Christopher Nolan doesn't. He does write the script, but somebody else helps him with the script. You know, Christopher Nolan doesn't design the set. He found someone else designs the set. And Christopher Nolan puts gives his input onto it. So it's a it's a collaborative movement. You know, I think there obviously directors have more have the most important role in the collabor collaborative collaborative process, but uh, they're not. It is not one person. And I think we 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 fall into a trap if we think that one person makes the movie, and one person's voice. I think what's more dangerous about that is that it's one person. Um, if we it, it gives the impression that one person must be in control, and when you're starting off as a filmmaker, you, you think you have to con you have to control everything and do everything, and that's really a recipe for disaster. You need to bring other people involved and get other people's thoughts. So anyhow, I'm starting to lose it here. I'm getting tired. I need to get some lunch. I haven't breakfast yet. Let me go see Joe and, and we'll get some, get some lunch here. Uh, a couple more questions. What do you think of the curated streaming? 
sites like Mubai compared to regular Netflix, I would probably prefer them. I just haven't, I haven't had time to do any of that. <laughs> I haven't had time to watch any. Are 3D films diminishing? Probably. I don't think there's much hope for 3D anymore. It's just like every every time the 3D is, if you look back through history, there's there's like at least three or four different, there might be four now, four movements of 3D. They always rise and fall, rise and fall. It's a novelty that doesn't seem to catch on. I don't think it will. I think VR will, will catch on. I think VR will be more important than 3D. Uh, no thoughts on Stephen King <laughs> in the stand. All right, guys, I'm going to have to end it up here a little early. Thanks for hanging out with me. Uh, as always, you can check out our Patreon. I haven't, yet, I haven't posted anything on Patreon. I'll have to do some, put some stuff up there. Oh, there's my music. Oh, bring it down a little bit. That's allowed. So I'm calling out. So check out Patreon. i am got to produce a video pretty soon here for uh, one of our new sponsors coming on board. Uh, just for some equipment. So good stuff. Uh, check out the merch store in the merch shelf below. Uh, and uh, otherwise, all that's left for me to say is to go out there, make something great. We'll be back next Wednesday. And uh, hopefully I'll be at least in the process of producing a new video by then. Alrighty, guys. We shall see you later. And take care of yourselves. Stay safe.